Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to day four of Sankalp 2020. I'm Amit Patia, founder of Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, hosting your daily edition of a 30 minutes plenary on Impact Future. In the early years of 1510, the theology professor and parish priest Martin Luther traveled to Rome on church business. Coincidentally, at the same time, the great Michelangelo was also working on the ceiling of the fabled Sistine Chapel. Thus, like every other tourist visiting the beautiful city, he bought a printed guidebook and roamed every attraction in Rome, including pilgrimage to churches. His observations would lead him to write the first bestseller of the modern world. When Luther returned to Germany, he inc became increasingly wary of the common practice of selling indulgences. It was a practice of selling a pardon or called an indulgence to an individual which could potentially reduce the length and severity of his punishment that heavens might impose for his or her sins. Yes, you could buy salvation rather than perform true inward repentance, which meant using the confessional in the eyes of Luther. In fact, Pope Julius II actually financed the rebuilding of the monumental St. Peter's Cathedral using the funds collected from selling indulgences. So on a cold October morning in 1517, Luther wrote a letter to church superiors urging an end to the abuse of indulgences. The new technology of the printing press played a major role in the spread of Luther's ideas. The Gutenberg Bible may have been the first major book published in the West, but the first bestseller was the printed copy of Martin Luther's Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences commonly known as the 95 Thesis. The thesis were hugely controversial. In the early 1518, over 800 copies were burned in Wittenberg alone. It instigated political turmoil. He was excommunicated and declared a criminal, but he refused to back down. In recent times, activists, economists, thinkers are drawing an uncanny parallel between the introduction of carbon credits to offset emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases with the distasteful practice of selling an indulgence, since it gives the company a rhetorical get out of jail free card for essentially committing an environmental sin. Annual emissions have to reduce by 29 to 32 gigatons of equivalent CO2 by 2030 to maintain a fighting chance to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is a five-fold increase on current ambition. Buying carbon credits in exchange for a clean conscience while you carry on flying, buying diesel cars and powering your homes with fossil fuels is being challenged by people concerned about climate change. During the Renaissance, Martin Luther claiming the right of individual conscience over the authority of the church struck the symbolic blow that began the protesters reformation and subsequently counter-reformation. At the Impact Future Project, we will ensure that stakeholder capitalism is not just paid a lip service, but put into practice. We will partner India Inc. to plan and prepare for this era of impact capitalism. I see the recent rebellion by two thirds of Procter and Gamble shareholders led by BlackRock who voted to demand that PNG re revisits how it uses palm oil and forest pulp in products including bounty paper towels and Charmin toilet paper as a public rebuke. We must become Martin Luther's, end the indulgence economy and usher in a real impact economy. Today, our five speakers will all talk about seeding real impact assets. Let's begin with Gabriela Gandhi, Executive Director of Impact Hub. Gabriela is an experienced leader of an innovative and energetic global impact hub network based in Vienna. She's building truly global infrastructure for catalyzing and scaling social enterprises. We at Aspire Impact are delighted to partner Impact Hub and bring their offerings to Indian incubators and accelerators. Gabriela stands for Connected Humanity, acting as a power for good. Please welcome Gabriela Gandhi. Hello, 
everybody, my name is Gabriela Gandel and I'm the Global Executive Director of the Impact Hub Network. At the Impact Hub, we have built the world's largest community of impact-driven entrepreneurs. We currently support over 16,500 such entrepreneurs in all five continents across 55 countries. Yearly, we deliver over 400 incubation, acceleration and scaling programs alongside partners from the public, private and civil society sector. And we often connect with other impact ecosystems in order to learn, to exchange ideas, to exchange practices, and very importantly, collaborate for impact at scale in the transition towards an economy. As such, we are delighted to collaborate with Aspire Impact in order to connect to the Indian ecosystem, bringing forward our community and knowledge, but also learning from the progress, development, great solutions and partnerships, and of course, the impact that is already happening on the ground in the Indian impact ecosystem. We are very supportive of the Impact Futures program that Aspire is curating, in particular for three reasons. First and foremost, it is a great call to action to accelerate our progress towards the new economy. It empowers leaders and connects leaders from all sectors, public, private and civil society, to understand the systemic challenges that we face in advancing our economy in that direction, but very importantly, create collaborative solutions, solutions that can replicate, that can scale, that can be invested upon by private and public investors, that can create a true opportunity for significant job creation and job transformation, skill building and accessibility. And last but not least, they create uh, opportunity for businesses to engage as they themselves have to become competitive and connect with the new uh, trend towards the green transition, towards the new economy and towards a more inclusive economy that is a solution for the many. In the Impact Futures project, we also support that it will bring inspiration to other impact ecosystems and to other countries around the world, in particular powerhouses like India is for the world, where stakeholders could truly come together and be inspired to do so by your example, in order to address the grand challenges of their own time through innovative and collaborative solutions. And last but not least, we support the Impact Futures project by collaborating with Aspire Impact to focus on the role of incubators and accelerators as one of the key actors enabling these new enterprises to become reality and to accelerate to the size and the scale that we need them to do in order to transition to the new economy. Together with Aspire Impact, we'll be curating a new offering for uh, catalyzing the Indian impact ecosystems for incubators and accelerator, uh, accelerators called the Impact Startup Support Program. And within this program, we're going to be addressing three main trends that we see key to the success of incubators and accelerators. First and foremost, we're going to focus on bringing the intersection of entrepreneurial business support with knowledge on the environmental transition, on circularity, on the green transition. And thirdly, knowledge and practices and tools around inclusion and the societal transformation that's needed in order to ensure that the ideas that we develop and incubate and accelerate truly are a solution for the many and not just for a few. Secondly, we're gonna look at connecting with incubators and, and accelerators way beyond the niche area of the impact ecosystems. At the end of the day, we want to serve the broader, small and medium enterprises and small and growing enterprises that truly are the hotbed of innovation, of job creation and of GDP around the world. As we know, they represent more than 60% of uh, global GDP and more than 70% of global jobs. So we need to make sure that incubators and accelerators all across the small and medium enterprise ecosystem are ready and have the capacity to bring the impact economy in their practices, in their tools, in their offering toward the entrepreneurs and the small and medium enterprises that they serve around the world. And the third trend we're gonna be looking at is of course the digital transformation and how incubators and accelerators better connect with technology trends and use these methods and practices and tools in order to support the scaling of their solutions. All of this wrapped up in strong practices for impact measurement, not only at the output level, but also at the outcome level to ensure that at the end of the day, our efforts of incubation and acceleration for this idea that will come from the Impact Futures program will truly generate the impact at scale towards the new economy. Overall, we hope you'll be connecting with us and supporting the transition to the new economy and the Impact Futures program, as well as the incubation support program 
and we will find ways in which together we will be stronger and accelerate our transition. Thank you, Gabriela. Our second speaker today is Rima Subramanian, co-founder and managing partner of Ankur Capital. Rima co-founded Ankur with the vision to use her entrepreneurial experience to bring the tools to young impact startups to become game changers. She has worked across agriculture, education, and information technology, taking young companies from business plans to high growth ventures. She's also a community leader at IFP's Food Agri and Ag Tech community. Please welcome Rima Subramanian. Hi. Food has always been the core of our existence. COVID-19, more than anything else, has brought to focus what we eat, how it's produced, how is it brought to our table. And it has not only got everybody thinking for the present, but also for the future. Is it sustainable? The consumer is demanding to know this. And on the other hand, the farmer, who's always had been, who's always been at the brink of disaster due to being at vagaries of nature, whether it is in terms of productivity losses or in terms of the fact the supply chain is waiting to, to exploit. And they've always been at the risk, at a risk of uh, being uh, shortchanged by the market forces. And this has always this is the reason why we see is the fact that agri sector has always been in distress, but that's changing. We're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs coming in with solutions which can impact the lives of the farmer and give better, better food to the consumer on their table. On the production side, let's say it's a fact the farmer is being helped with better productivity techniques. In this last few decades, there's been a lot of investments in biotech and it's getting accelerated with better inputs, better seeds, less harmful pesticides, which is all ensuring that the productivity of the farmer goes up. In addition, the farmer with access to digital technologies now has information on global best practices. This is obviously in helping the farmer get to better, uh, uh, get better returns from their farming. The supply chain digitization has ensured that, the, this, that there is a disintermediation to a large extent. In addition, because there is no longer asymmetry in information flow, all the stakeholders in the system get more equitable returns. In addition, the supply chains are seeing a lot of investments in terms of more uh, storage facilities, better storage in terms of logistics, in terms of quality assessment of food, better packaging. There's a lot of innovation that's happening on this, in these spaces. All these together are ensuring that the supply chains are more transparent, are uh, geared to give more equitable returns to all the stakeholders. Again, that means better returns to the farmers. Let's say on the consumption end, consumers are demanding healthier food. They want to increase protein intake. They want sustainably grown food. For example, not water uh, guzzlers like rice, but would like to eat healthier climate smart crops such as millets. On the case of alternate proteins, uh, you have plant meat uh, uh, or uh, meatless meat that's grown, which ensures that we have a more sustainable world that we are living in. All these are going towards ensuring that the consumer gets the best to eat and also better returns for the farmers. We have over 570 million farmers globally, small and medium scale farmers who are waiting for the, the agri supply chains, the agri sector to be functioning differently. I'm really happy to note that whether it's entrepreneurs who are bringing in the best technologies to the sector, which has been the least impacted with technology over the years, is seeing a lot of change. 
these entrepreneurs are being supported by investors, by government policies, as well as across other stakeholders, whether it is grant making or whether it is R&D institutions. Last year, in 2019, India saw an investment of $650 million in agri, agri tech and food startups. Next year, we expect north of $500 million to go into the sector at the very minimum. Ankur, at Ankur Capital, we would like to work with projects such as the Impact Future Project to create those frameworks for the change to happen. Thank you, Rima. Our third speaker today is Abhishek Agrawal, Chief Regional Officer of Axion in India. Abhishek is responsible for overseeing Axion's investment and mission to advance financial inclusion in India and is deeply committed to fintech innovation. He serves on the boards of Subke, Dwara and Vindhya and will co-chair IFP's BFSI Financial Inclusion and Fintech Impact Community. A fellow at Aspire Circle, I have known Abhishek for a long time as an expert in strategy, business transformation and financial management. Please welcome Abhishek Agrawal. Hello friends, it is my absolute pleasure to be here. What has been achieved over the last three, four decades of cumulative impact work, either in terms of lifting people out of poverty or employment generation or freedom for hunger um, or financial inclusion, it has been pushed back by a few years of all of our work due to economic constraints and lockdown related impacts. Millions of people have been pushed into unknown and economic uh, uncertainties. The work which we plan to do at Impact Future Project is to build a collaborative brainstorming platform which can harness the power from influencers to change the course of and accelerate the power of impact, whether it is from policy, advocacy, execution or capitalism. This can only be achieved when we will look at problems together and build a vision to solve them. And as I said, collective, our work is more important now than ever. Impact Future Project aspire to unlock the ideas that can help India in drawing $1 trillion by 2030, which can enable in India in $10 trillion economy. This is ambitious, but very much possible. What it needs is the ideas and collaborative efforts of various stakeholders on a digital platform like impact future by running where we intend to run various thematic cohorts in line with sustainable development goals from United Nations. We have mapped SDGs with Indian government initiatives and are looking at various private and public sector initiatives. And we will be discussing how we can set the future for a bigger and better impact to achieve these ambitious goals. I am here representing financial inclusion and fintech cohort of IFP and as a co-chair of the cohort along with my other colleagues, I welcome all of you in this debate, setting an ambitious agenda for our future and coming generation to change the course. I invite the ideas from all of you and request your participation on the platform in setting the course and the agenda, which can help for the future narrative. As I invite you, I would also like to throw some ideas which we can discuss, debate and think about, which can help in building our future. Given more than 2 billion people around the globe are still financially excluded. And while India has taken a huge leapfrog on financial inclusion, we still need to look at democratizing the choice and delivery of financial products and services, whether we call it insurance product where we can make it easy and convenient for underserved and unserved where they can buy and get serviced for those products. Or it is about bringing the banking at the doorstep of unserved. Or it is about exposure of the equity market to the rural customer. Or risk appetite based bite size mutual fund investments. We need to explore, harness the power of blockchain for financial services 
and link them to the agricultural records such as land ownership, crop cultivation, warehouse financing and contracts. We need to explore how we can build the alternative credit scores for millions of customers who do not have credit scores and thus lack the access of credit products from the formal sector. I can continue to go on. But what I would really like to end my note on, let's explore and work on the ideas which can bring financial inclusion through the use of technology to every household and individual. Look forward to hear from you and interact with you. Till then, enjoy the event and be safe. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Abhishek. Our fourth speaker today is Shashank Avasti, co-founder of Vishesh, alongside his co-founder P. Rajashekran, an impact enterprise that assists persons with disabilities in education, training, and job placements, and organizations with disability inclusion and hiring. Co-founder of a national award-winning enterprise, Shashank is an Aspire Circle Fellow on our Aspire Circle's Council of Governors and co-chair of IFP's Accessibility, Disabilities and Inclusion Impact Community. Please welcome Shashank Avasti. I'm delighted to be co-chair on the track for Accessibility, Disabilities and Inclusion at a time when change is in the air in our country. The Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act of 2016, Government of India's Accessible India campaign, also called as Sukhamya Bharat Abhiyan, and the rollout of the Swap Lamban card are just but some few measures that are laying the foundation for a structural change in the area of accessibility. Having said that, persons with disabilities remain one of the most excluded, vulnerable, and marginalized communities uh, in our country. With tokenism abound, whether it's advertisements, forwards on social medias, or general conversations. Uh, this can only change when persons with disabilities are truly included as equals and they participate just like any one of us without being held back of the barriers in their environment. And that is a responsibility not only of the state, but of businesses, of all organizations, and of each of us as individuals. Uh, whether in our capacity as professionals or uh, inside the organizations that we may be uh, working with. Fortunately, this is not just a responsibility, but it's also an opportunity. Opportunity uh, in inclusion is not just some very fuzzy and soft benefits that are out there, a couple of photographs and things like that, but there is a very tangible economic and social outcome uh, that inclusion tends to deliver. As persons with disabilities participate more and more as students and job seekers, uh, they will then go on to become better job providers and economically uh, active consumers and taxpayers as well. Uh, all of this will hopefully lead to a positive spiral where not only are they getting better included, but we are able to serve all our consumers well across all lines of businesses. Sectors like business processing, hospitality, retail have benefited from hiring persons with disabilities as um, their staff members and they have gone on then in many instances to include them actively as their customers and that has proven the business case. Unfortunately though there remain more examples than what is mainstream and visible across all sorts of businesses. I see two key drivers for growth um, in this area. Uh, one is of course the regulation um, because regulation is related to an economic opportunity, not just because it provides you a healthy working environment, but it also enables you to look at the larger and diverse set of consumers that are out there. Um, the framework that the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, for example, has provided has given a lot of comfort to employers and other organizations to recognize how to include persons with disabilities uh, in the course of their business and their services. Sectors like aviation have done such a good job uh, in including consumers and uh, seen an uptick in how they're able to serve the consumers and those um, in their family and friends uh, as well. Um, there are enough and more names uh, in sectors like hospitality and retail that have actively reached out to these uh, unserved customers and made available to them a simple experience that would be available to all persons without disabilities over the last few years. 
um, I think it's just a matter of time before we start seeing participants in areas as diverse as real estate, maybe media, entertainment, uh, making serious progress, including persons with disabilities. Uh, while we continue on our march to include persons with disabilities as clients and as customers and then as consumers as well, I don't think we can afford to look away from the fact that they are significantly excluded in areas like um, education, skilling, and access to jobs. And that's what is really holding them back from uh, participating to their best uh, abilities and potential. So this is an area where businesses, not-for-profits, um, the state, um, and all of us as individuals have got to participate. And there's much to be learned because not only will persons with disabilities get included, but we get included in their lives. As an impact investor, I see two large scale opportunities. Uh, one would be indirectly serving persons with disabilities that are currently being excluded um, in forms of development of services, platforms and products for their needs. You know, we've been for too long restricted in thinking about products like only wheelchairs. But there are many others uh, that could improve access to education, to learning, to consumption, to uh, leisure, etc., which could be very, very relevant. On the other end of the spectrum are existing large-scale businesses that want to include persons with disabilities um, as their consumers. And this would need for changes in terms of training, in terms of products, or in terms of services, or how they are delivered, for example. And, uh, you know, think of the largest uh, sectors of consumers, whether it's retail, whether it's entertainment, whether it's financial services, and you'll see that the services are simply not accessible. And I think there's going to be a lot of work and innovation that's going to come out there. And that's going to significantly expand the market for all of these uh, service providers. And I think as a venture capitalist, it's going to be very, very exciting to watch how this uh, change in inclusion is going to make lives better for um, all of us. Thank you, Shashank. And our final speaker for the fourth and penultimate day is Deepali Khanna, Rockefeller Foundation's Managing Director for Asia. Deepali leads the foundation's policy, advocacy, grant making, and strategic partnerships in Asia. She previously managed Smart Power for Rural Development, the foundation's flagship initiative in India, Myanmar, and Africa. Dipali comes with over three decades of global experience with organizations like MasterCard Foundations and UNICEF. She is leader for IFP's Gender Equality Women and Livelihoods Community. Please welcome Dipali Khan. As I'm here today, addressing the future of impact in gender equality and for women across the world, I must in fact address the status quo and the realities that actually exist. Decades of experience working close to the communities and with my female colleagues across organizations has made me uniquely aware of the role that women play. They are the key cogs that keep the machinery of their societies, nations and economies running. From mothers who keep family units intact, to tribal leaders, to health workers, there are many women leaders in every sector working to improve humanity. Perhaps this is why a lot of the interventions in the development sector have been centered around women, because we know that when women are empowered, communities thrive and benefits reach all. So it is clear that achieving gender equality isn't just a moral issue, it makes economic sense. But does it truly translate into action? Not quite. Although we are getting closer to gender parity, change isn't happening fast enough. In the last 10 years, we have only closed the gap by 4% and it would take the world another 118 years. Yes, you heard it right, 118 years or until 2133 to close the economic gap entirely. This doesn't even account for the cultural and structural readjustments needed in society for true gender equality outside the economic realm. So is the situation all grim? Again, not quite. Recent surveys by the Pew Research Center in 24 countries show that 94% think it is important for women in their country to have the same rights as men, with 74% saying this is very important. 
Moreover, in most countries where overwhelming majorities endorse equality, men and women do not differ in their views. So there is momentum and there is optimism. What we need to do is capitalize upon this to make catalytic strides for gender equality. And this is where the future of impact lies. Platforms like the Impact Future Project are therefore necessary to get the brightest and the most influential minds together to solve these challenges and trigger new paradigm shifts. This can also create synergies between the work of different impact actors and break the silos that exist for amplified impact. As we bounce back from the pandemic, it is also critical that investments in economic resurgence be gender sensitive. In our experience, we know that our work in ending energy poverty has really kept women in the foreground. Women-led microenterprises have thrived. Girls have been able to study longer. Women don't have to face adverse health effects of indoor kerosene-based cooking. And overall, streetlights have made women feel more secure. This requires a conscious effort, and it requires investment in gender-sensitive programming. Let me take the story of Ruby Kumari, who's a resident in one of the villages where we have been providing access to reliable and quality electricity. Before COVID-19 struck, she was running a home-based sewing school with 80 students. However, as the pandemic gutted her earnings, newly widowed Ruby got back to work while taking care of her two loved ones. Using one do-it-yourself video, she learned how to make masks and employed 10 women who were similarly struggling in their new venture. This is the resilient spirit of women that we need to support and amplify using our investments and influence. We need to put gender at the heart of large scaling programming, especially in healthcare, education, and economic livelihoods. We need to invest in reforming inequitable gender systems, including the underlying norms, practices, and decision-making processes that lead to systemic barriers and persistent discrimination against women and girls, as well as create opportunities and support systems for women and girls to exercise leadership, voice, agency, and power. This also includes investing in readdressing historical disadvantages faced by women and girls, especially in the global South. As we enter an advanced fourth industrial age, this also means monitoring gender parity in the professions of the future and guiding the emerging labor market to more equitable outcomes in the future work. This also means taking real and tangible steps to ensure that women representatives are included and consulted to advocate for policies with a gender lens to create favorable conditions such as safety nets for women workers. COVID-19 wrested control of our global narrative this year. We can take back the pen and rewrite the world's future by moving to establish greater gender balance and put women entrepreneurs among those at the forefront of recovery. The future is bright and it is equal. And together, I'm certain we can reach there. Thank you so much. Dipali, thank you. Friends, thank you for being with us. Please join me in expressing gratitude to Gabriela, Rima, Abhishek, Shashank, and Deepali for their wonderful micro keynotes. Tomorrow, for a final time, between 11 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., you will hear five more impact leaders for five minutes each. This indulgence is permissible. From all of us at Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, thank you.